now. Good evening, everyone, and welcome once again in the new year, 2021, to Drunk Shakespeare. We are here with a fantastic cast tonight, and we present to you King Lear. So without further ado, please enjoy this production of King Lear. I thought the king had more affected the Duke of Albany than Cornwall. It did always seem so to us, but now in the division of the kingdom, it appears not which five of the, which of the dukes he values most, for equalities are so weighed that curiosity in neither can make choice of either's moiety. Is not this your son, my lord? His breeding, sir, hath been at my charge. I have so often blushed to acknowledge him that I am now brazed to it. I cannot conceive you. Sir, this young fellow's mother could, whereupon she grew round-wombed and had indeed, sir, a son for her cradle, ere she had a husband for her bed, do you smell a fault? I cannot wish the fault undone, the issue of it being so proper. But I have a son, sir by order of law, some year elder than this, who is yet, yet is no dearer in my account. Though this knave came something saucily to the world before he was sent for, yet was his mother fair, there was good sport at his making, and the whore son must be acknowledged. Do you know this noble gentleman, Edmund? No, my lord. My lord of Kent, remember him hereafter as my honorable friend. Yeah, my services to your lordship. I must love you and sue to know you better. Sir, I shall study deserving. He hath been out nine years and away he shall again. Oh, the king is coming. Attend the Lords of France and Burgundy, Gloucester. I shall, my lord. Meantime, we will express our darker purpose. Give me that map there. Know that we have divided into three our kingdom, and tis our fast intent to shake all cares and business from our age conferring them on younger strengths whilst we unburdened crawl toward death. Our son of Cornwall, and you, no less loving son of Albany, we have this hour a constant will to publish our daughter's several dowers that for fortune, future strife may be prevented now. The two great princes, France and Burgundy, Great rivals in our youngest daughter's love, long in our court have made their amorous sojourn, and here are to be answered. Tell me, my daughters, since now we will divest us both of rule, interest of territory, cares of state, uh, which of you, shall we say, doth love us most? That we our largest bounty may extend where nature doth with merit challenge. Goneril, our youngest born, speak first. Sir, I love you more than words can wield the matter. Dearer than eyesight, space and liberty, beyond all that which can be, be valued rich or rare, no less than life with grace, health, beauty, honor, as much as child heir loved or father found, a love that makes breath poor and speech unable. Beyond all manner of so much, I love you. What shall Cordelia speak? Love and be silent. Of all these bounds, even from this line to this, with shadowy forests and with champagnes rich with plenteous rivers and wide-skirted meads, we make thee lady. 
to thine and Albany's issue be this perpetual. What says our second daughter, our dearest Regan wife of Cornwall? Speak! I am made of that self-metal as my sister and prize me at her worth. In my true heart, I find she names my very deed of love, only she comes too short that I profess myself an enemy to all other joys, which the most precious square of sense possesses, and find I, I alone felicitate in your dear highness's love. Hmm. Then poor Cordelia, and yet not so, since I am sure my love's more ponderous than my tongue. <laughs> to thee and thine hereditary ever, Remain this ample third of our fair kingdom. No less in space, validity, and pleasure than that conferred on Goneril. Now, our joy, although our last and least, to whose young love the vines of France and milk of Burgundy strive to be interested, what can you say to draw a third more opulent than your sisters. Speak! <laughs> Nothing, my lord. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing will come of nothing, speak again. <laughs> Unhappy I am, I, I, I cannot heave my heart into my mouth. I love your majesty, according to my bond, no more nor less. How now, Cordelia, mend your speech a little, lest you may mar your fortunes. You have begot me, bred me, and loved me. I return those duties back as right are right fit, obey you, love you, and most honor you. Why have my sisters husbands if they say love they love you at all? Happily, when shall I shall wed that that lord whose hand take hit my plight shall carry half my love with him, half my care and duty. Sure, I shall never marry like my sisters to love my father all. But goes thy heart with this? I, my good lord. So young and so untender. So young, my lord, and true. Let it be so. Thy truth then be thy dower. For by the sacred radiance of the sun, the mysteries of Hecate of the night, by all the operation of the orbs from whom we do exist and cease to be, here I disclaim my parental care, prop inequity and property of blood, and as a stranger to my heart and me, hold thee from this forever, the barber's Scythian. Or he that makes his generation messes to gorge his appetite, shall to my bosom be as well neighbored, pitied, and relieved as thou, my sometime daughter. Good, my liege. Peace, Kent. Come not between the dragon and his wrath. I loved her most and thought to set my rest on her kind nursery. Hence, and avoid my sight. So be my grave, my peace, as here I give her father's heart from her. Call France! Who stirs? Call Burgundy! Cornwall and Albany, with my two daughters' dowers, digest the third. Let pride, which she calls plainless, marry her. I do invest you jointly with my power, preeminence, and all the large effects the troop and majesty, ourself by monthly course, with reservation of an hundred nights by you to be sustained, shall our abode make with you by due turn. Only we shall remain, retain the name and all the addition to a king. The sway, revenue, execution of the rest, beloved sons, <laughs> be yours, which, to confirm, this coronet part between you. Royal Lear, whom I have ever honored as my king, 
loved as my father and my master followed as my great patron thought and in all my prayers. The bow is bent and drawn, make from the shaft. Let it fall rather, though the fork invade the region of my heart. Be Kent unmalily when deer is mad. What wouldst thou do, old man? Think'st thou that duty shall have bread to speak when power to flattery bows? The plainness honours bound when majesty falls to folly. Reserve thy state and in thy best consideration check this hideous rashness. Answer my life, my judgment, thy youngest daughter does not love thee least, nor are those empty-hearted whose low sounds reverb no hollowness. Kent all thy life no more. My life I never held but as a pawn to wage against thine enemies, nor fear to lose it, thy safety be my motive. Out of my sight. See better, Lear. Let me still remain the true blank of thine eye. Now by Apollo. Now by Apollo, king, thou swearest thy gods in vain. Out, vassal, miscreant. Dear sir, yes, forbear. Sir. forbear. The physician and thy fee bestow upon the foul disease. Revoke thy gift, or thus I can vent clamour from my throat. I'll tell thee thou dost evil. Hear me, recreant. On thine allegiance, hear me. That thou hast sought to make us break our vows, which we durst never yet, and with strained pride, to come betwixt our sentence and our power, which nor our nature nor our place can hear. Our potency made good. Take thy reward. Five days we do allot thee for provision to shield thee from disasters of the world and all the six to turn thy hated back upon our kingdom. If on the tenth day following thy banished trunk be found in our dominions, the moment is thy death. Away! By Jupiter, this shall not be revoked. Fare thee well, king. Sith thus wilt appear, freedom lives hence, and banishment is here. The gods to their dear shelter take thee maid, but justly thinks, and hast most rightly said. And your large speeches may your deeds approve, the good effects may spring from words of love. As Kent, O princes, is you all adieu, he'll shape his old course in a country new. Here's France and Burgundy, my noble lord. My lord of Burgundy, we first address toward you, who with this king hath rivaled for our daughter. What is the least will you require in present dower with her or cease your quest of love? <laughs> Most royal majesty, I crave no more than half your highness offered, nor will you tender less. Right, noble Burgundy, when she was dear to us, we did hold her so. But now her price is fallen. Sir, <laughs> there she stands. If aught within that little seeming substance, or all of it, with our displeasure pierced, pieced, and nothing more, may fitly like your grace, She's there, and she is yours. I know no answer. Oh, will you, with these infirmities she owes, unfriended, new adopted to our hate, dowered with our curse, and strangered with our oath, take her or leave her? <laughs> Pardon me, royal sir. Election makes not up in such conditions. Then leave her, sir, for the power that made me, I tell you, all her wealth. For you, great king, I would not from your love make such a stray to match you where I hate. Therefore, beseech you to avert your liking a more worthier way than on a wench whom nature is ashamed almost to acknowledge hers. This is, is most strange <clears throat> that she who even but now was your best object, the argument of your praise, balm of your age, the best the dearest, should it this trice time commit a thing so monstrous to dismantle so many folds of favor? Sure, her offense must be of such unnatural degree that masters it or your forevouched affection fall into taint, 
which to believe of her must be a faith that reason without miracle should never plant in me. I yet beseech your majesty, if for I want that glib and oily art to speak and purpose not, since what I well intend, I'll, I'll do it before I speak, that you make known it is no vicious blot, murder, or foulness, no unchaste action or dishonored step that hath deprived me of your grace and favor, no, no, but even for want of that for which I am richer, a still soliciting eye and such a tongue that I am, I am glad I have not, thou not, not to have it, hath lost me your liking. Better thou hadst not been born than not to have pleased me better. Is it but this, a tardiness in nature, which often leaves the history unspoke that it intends to do? My lord of Burgundy, what say you to the lady? Love's not love when it is mingled with regards that stands aloof from the entire point. Will you have her? She is herself a dowry. Uh, royal king, give but that portion which yourself propose. And here I take Cordelia by the hand, Duchess of Burgundy. Nothing. I have sworn. I am firm. I am sorry, then. You have so lost a father that you must lose a husband. Peace be with you, Burgundy. Since that respect and fortunes are his love, I shall not be his wife. Fairest Cordelia, that art most rich being poor, most choice forsaken, and most loved despised. Thee and thy virtues here I seize upon, be it lawful I take up what's cast away. Gods, gods, tis strange that from their cold's neglect my love should kindle to inflamed respect. Thy dowerless daughter king, thrown to my chance, is queen of us, of ours, and our fair France. Not all the dukes of waterish Burgundy can buy this unprized precious maid of me. Bid them farewell, Cordelia, though unkind. Thou losest here a better where to find. Thou hast her, France. Let her be thine. For we have no such daughter nor shall ever see that face of hers again. <coughs> Therefore, be gone without our grace, our love, our benison. Hop, noble Burgundy. <sighs> Bid farewell to your sisters. The jewels of our father, with washed eyes, Cordelia leads you. I, I know what you are, and like a sister, am most loath to call your faults as they are named. Love well, father. To your professed bosoms I commit him. But yet, alas, stood I within his grace. I would prefer him to do a better place. So farewell to you both. Describe us not our duty. Let your study be to content your Lord, who hath received you at fortune's arms. You have obedience scanted, and well are worth the want that you have wanted. Time shall unfold with plighted cunning hides, who covers faults at last with shame derides. Well may you prosper. Come, my fair Cordelia. Sister, it is not little I have to say of what most nearly appertains to us both. I think our father will hence tonight. That is most certain, and with you next month with us. 
you see how full of changes his age is. The observation we have made of it hath not been little. He always loved our sister most, and with what poor judgment he hath now cast her off appears too grossly. The infirmity of his age. Yet he hath ever but slenderly known himself. The best and soundest of his time hath been but rash. Then must we look from his age to receive not alone the imperfections of long engraft condition, but therewithal the unruly waywardness that infirm and choleric years bring with them. What inconstant starts are we like to have from him as this of Kent's banishment? There is further compliment of leave-taking between France and him. Pray you, let us sit together. If our father carry authority with such disposition as he bears, this last surrender of his will but offend us. We shall further think of it. We must do something, and in the heat. Thou, nature, art my goddess. To thy law my services are bound. Wherefore should I stand in the plague of custom and permit the curiosity of nations to deprive me for that I am some 12 or 14 moonshines lag of my brother? Why bastard? Wherefore base when my dimensions are as well compact, my mind as generous and my shape as true as honest madam's issue? Why brand they? us with base, with baseness, bastardy, base, base. Who in the lusty stealth of nature take more composition and fierce quality than doth within a dull, stale, tired bed go to the creating a whole tribe of fox got tween asleep and awake? Well then, legitimate Edgar, I must have your land. Our father's love is to the bastard Edmund as to the legitimate, fine word legitimate, well, my legitimate, on this letter speed, and my invention thrive, Edmund the base shall top of the legitimate. I grow, I prosper. <laughs> now, gods, stand up for bastards. Oh, Kent mm. banished thus, and France and collar parted, and the king gone tonight prescribed his power, confined to exhibition? All this done upon the gad. Edmund, how now? What news? So oh, please, your lordship, none. Why so earnestly seek you to put up that letter? I know no news, my lord. <laughs> what paper were you reading? Nothing, my lord. No? Hmm? What needed then that terrible dispatch of it into your pocket? The quality of nothing hath not such need to hide itself. Let's see. Come, if it be nothing, I shall not need spectacles. I beseech you, sir, pardon me. It is a letter from my brother that I have not all or read or read. And for so much as I have pursued, I find it not fit for your looking. Give me the letter, sir. I shall offend either to detain or give it. The contents, as in part I understand them, are to blame. Let's see. Let's see. I hope for my brother's justification, he wrote this but as an essay or taste of my virtue. This policy and reverence of age makes the world bitter to the best of our times, keeps our fortunes from us till our oldness cannot relish them. I begin to find an idle and fond bondage in the oppression of age tyranny, who sways not as it hath power, but as it is suffered. Come to me that of this I may speak more, if our father would sleep till I waked him, you should enjoy half his revenue forever and live the beloved of your brother. Edgar. Hmm. Conspiracy? <laughs> sleep till I wake him, you should enjoy half his revenue? 
my son, Edgar, had he a hand to write this, a heart and brain to breed it in? What came you to this? Who brought it? It was not brought me, my lord. There's the cunning of it. I found it thrown in the casement of my closet. You know the character to be your brother's? If the matter were good, my lord, I dare swear it were his. But in respect of that, I would fain think it were not. It is his. It is his hand, my lord, but I hope his heart is not in the content contents. Has he never before sounded you in this business? Never, my lord, but I have her, I have heard him oft maintain to be fit that at sons at perfect age and father's decline, the father should be as ward to the son and the son manage his revenue. Villain, villain, his very opinion in the letter abhorred villain, unnatural, detested, brutish villain. Oh, worse than brutish. Go, sirrah, seek him. I'll apprehend him, abominable villain. Where is he? I do not know. I do not well know, my lord. If it shall please you to suspend your indignation against my brother till you can derive from him better testimony of his intent, you should run a certain course where, if you violently proceed against him, mistaking his purpose, it would not make a great gap in your own honor and shake in pieces the heart of his obedience. I dare pawn down my own life for him, that he hath writ this to feel my affection to your honor and to no other pretense of danger. Think you so? If your honor judge it meet, I will place you where you shall hear us confer of this and by an oracle assurance, have your satisfaction and that without any further delay than this very evening. <sighs> he cannot be such a monster. I was not sure to his father that so tenderly and entirely loves him. Heaven and earth. Edmund, seek him out. Wind me unto him, I pray you. Frame the business after your own wisdom. I would unstate myself to be in a due resolution. I will seek him, sir. And presently, convey the business as I shall find means and acquaint you with all. These late eclipses and the sun and moon portend no good to us. Though the wisdom of nature can reason it thus and thus, yet nature finds it scourged by the sequent effects. Love cools, friendship falls off, brothers divide in cities, mutinies and countries, discord in palaces, treason, and the bond cracked twixt son and father. This villain of mine comes under the prediction, their son against father. The king falls from bias of nature. There's father against child. We have seen the best of our time. Machinations, hollowness, treachery, and all ruinous disorders follow us disquietly to our graves. Find out this villain, Edmund. It shall lose thee nothing. Do it carefully. And the noble and true-hearted Kent banished. Oh, his offense, honesty. <laughs> Tis strange. Yeah. Well, this is the excellent property of the world that when we are sick in fortune, often that the surface of our own behavior, we make guilty of our own disasters, the sun and the moon and the stars, as if we were villains on necessity, fools by heavenly compulsion, knaves, thieves, and treacherous by spherical predominance, drunkards, liars, and adulterers by an enforced obedience of planetary influence, and all that we are evil in by a divine thrusting on, an admirable invasion 
of Whoremaster's man to lay his goatish disposition on the charge of a star. My father compounded with my mother under the dragon's tail, and my nativity was under Ursa Major. So that it follows, I am rough and lecherous. I should have been that I am, had the maidenly a star in the firmament twinkled on my bastardizing. Ah, Edgar. He comes like the catastrophe of the old comedy. My cue is villainous melancholy with a sigh like Tom of Bedlam. Oh, these eclipses do portend these divisions. Fa so la me. <laughs> Hello, brother Edmund. What serious contemplation are you in? I'm thinking, brother, of a prediction I read the other day that what should follow these eclipses. Do you busy yourself with that? I promise you, the effects he writes of, of succeed unhappily, as of unnaturalness between the child and the parent, death, dearth, disillusions of ancient amities, divisions in state, menaces and maledictions against the king and nobles, needless different diffidences, banishment of friends, dissipation of cohorts, nuptial breaches, and I know not what. How long have you been uh, sectary astronomical? Come, come. When saw you my father last? Oh, the night gone by. Spake with him? Aye, two hours together. Hey, did you on, parted you on good terms? Found you no displeasure in him by word or nor countenance? None at all. Bethink yourself wherein you may have offended him in at... My entreaty forbear his presence until some little time hath qualified the heat of his displeasure, which at this instant so rageth in him that with the mischief of your own person it would scarce allay. Some villain hath done me wrong. That's my fear. I pray you have a continent forbearance to the speed of his rage go slower and as I say, retire with me to my lodging from whence I will fitly bring you to hear my Lord speak, pray you, there's my key. If you do stir abroad, go armed. Wait, wait, wait. Armed, brother? Brother, I advise you to the best. I am no honest man, if there be any good meaning towards you. I've told you what I have seen and heard, but faintly, nothing like the image and horror of it. Pray you away. Uh, sh shall I hear from you anon? I do serve you in this business. A credulous father and a brother noble, whose nature is so far from doing harms that he suspects none, on whose foolish honesty my practice is right easily. I see the business. Let me, if not by birth, have lands by wit. All with me's meet that I can fashion it. Did my father strike my gentleman for chiding of his fool? Ay, madame. By day and night he wrongs me. Every hour he flashes into one gross crime or other that sets, it all, sets us all at odds. I'll not endure it. His nights grow riotous and himself upbraids us on every trifle. When he returns from hunting, I will not speak with him. Say I am sick. If you come slack of former services, you shall do well. The fault of it, I'll answer. He's coming, madam. I hear him. Put on what weary negligence you please, you and your fellows. I'd have it come to question. If he distaste it, let him to my sister, whose mind and mine I know are that in that are one. Not to be overruled, idle old man that still would manage those authorities that he hath given away. Now, by my life, old fools are babes again and must be used with checks as flatteries when they are seen abused. Remember what I have said. Well, madame. And let his knights have colder looks among you. What grows of it? No matter. Advise your fellows so. I would breed from hence occasions, and I shall, that I may speak. I'll write straight to my sister to hold my very course. Prepare for dinner. If 
as well by other accents borrow that can my speech diffuse, my good intent may carry through itself to that full issue for which I raised my likeness. Now, banished Kent, if thou canst serve while thou dost stand condemned, so may it come thy master whom thou lovest shall find thee full of labours. <laughs> oh, let me stay not a jot for dinner. Go, <coughs> get it ready. <laughs> oh, now, what art thou? A man, sir. What dost thou profess? What dost thou with us? I do profess to be no less than I seem, to serve him truly that will put me in trust, to love him that is honest, to converse with him that is wise and says little, to fear judgment, to fight when I cannot choose, and to eat no fish. What art thou? A very honest-hearted fellow, and as poor as the king. Well, if thou beest as poor for a subject as he is for a king, thou art poor enough. What, 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 what wouldst thou? Service. Who wouldst thou serve? No. <laughs> Dost thou know me, fellow? No, sir, but you have that in your countenance which I would fain call master. What's that? Authority. What services canst thou do? I can keep on his counsel, ride, run, mar a curious tale in the telling it, and deliver a plain message bluntly. That which ordinary men are fit for, I am qualified in, and the best of me is diligence. How old art thou? Not so young, sir, to love a woman for singing, or so old to dote on her for anything. I have years on my back, forty-eight. <laughs> Follow me, thou shalt serve me. If I like thee no worse after dinner, I will part from thee yet. Dinner! Oh, dinner! Where's my name, my fool? Go, you, and call my fool hither. You, 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 Sarah, where's my daughter? So please you. What says the fellow there? Make, call that clot pole back. Oh, where's my fool? I think the world's asleep. <coughs> ah, where are my knights? The one with the coconuts. Ah, probably asleep. Anyone answer me? What says that fellow there? Anyone? Call the clod pole back. He says, my lord, your daughter is not well. Why came the slave back to me not when I called him? Sir, he answered me in the roundest manner. He would not. He, he would not? My lord, I know not what the matter is, but to my judgment, your highness is not entertained with that ceremonious affection as you were wont. There's a great abatement of kindness appears as well as the general dependent as in the duke himself also and your daughter. Ha, ha, sayest thou so? I, I, I beseech you, pardon me, my lord, if, if I be mistaken for my duty cannot be silent when I think your highness wrong. Thou but rememberest me of mine own conception. I have perceived a most faint neglect of late, where I have rather blamed as mine own jealous curiosity than as a very pretense and purpose of unkindness. I will look further into it, but, but where's my fool? I haven't seen her these two days. Since my young lady's going into France, sir, the, the fool hath much pined away. No, no more of that. Uh, I have noted it well. Uh, go you and tell my daughter that I would speak with her. Go you call hither my fool. Oh, oh, you, you, sir. You, you come you hither, sir. Who am I, sir? My lady's father. My lady's father? My lord's knave, you horse on dog, you slave, you cur! I am one of these, my lord. I beseech your pardon. You bandy looks with me, you rascal! Uh, 
I'll not be stuck in my lord. No trip neither, you baseball football player. <laughs> I thank thee, fellow. Thou servest me, and I'll love thee. Come, sir, arise. Away, I'll teach you differences. Away, away. If you will measure your lubber's length again, tarry, but away. Go to. Have your wisdom. So? <laughs> <laughs> now, my friendly knave, I thank thee. Yeah, there. There's earnest of thy service. <laughs> Let me hire him, too. <sighs> Here's my coxcomb. Oh, no, my pretty knave. <laughs> no. Sirrah, you were best take my coxcomb. Why, my boy? Why? For taking one's part that's out of favor. <gasps> Nay, and now canst not smile as the wind sits. Thou catch cold shortly. <laughs> my coxcomb. Why, this fellow has banished Tuan's daughters and did the third a blessing against his will. If thou follow him, thou must needs wear my coxcomb. <laughs> An uncle. Would I had two coxcombs and two daughters. Why, my boy? Well, if I gave them all my living, I'd keep my coxcombs myself. There's mine. Beg another of thy daughters. Take heed, Sarah, the whip. <laughs> Truth's a dog must to kennel. He must be whipped out when the Lady Brock may stay by the fire and stink. A pestilent gall to me. <laughs> Sarah, I'll teach thee a speech. Do. Mark it, Knuckle. Have more than thou showest, speak less than thou knowest, lend less than thou owest, ride <laughs> more than thou goest, learn more than thou trowest, set less than thou throwest, leave thy drink and thy whore, and keep in a door, and thou shalt have more than two tenths to a score. This is nothing, fool. Then tis like the breath of an unfeed lawyer. You gave me nothing for it. Can you make no use of nothing, uncle? Why, no, boy, nothing can be made of nothing. <laughs> Prithee tell him, so much the rent of his land comes to. He will not believe a fool. A bitter fool. <laughs> Dost thou know the difference, my boy? between a bitter fool and a sweet one. Uh, no, lad, teach me. <laughs> that lord that counseled thee to give away thy land, come place him here by me. Do thou for him stand. The sweet and bitter fool will presently appear. The one in motley here, the other found out there. Dost thou call me fool, boy? All thy other titles thou hast given away. That thou wast born with. This is not altogether fool, my lord. No, faith. Lords and great men will not let me. If I had a monopoly out, they would have part on it. And ladies, too. They will not let me have all the fool to myself. They'll be snatching. <laughs> Nuncle, give me an egg. And I'll give thee two crowns. What two crowns shall they be? <laughs> Why, after I have cut the egg in the middle and eat up the meat, the two crowns of the egg. <laughs> when thou clovest thy crown in the middle and gavest away both parts, thou borst thine ass on thy back or the dirt. <laughs> Thou hast little wit in thy bald crown when thou gavest thy gold one away. If I speak like myself in this, let him be wit that first find it so. Fools had negress less grace in a year, for wise men are grown foppish and know not how their wits to wear. Their manners are so apish.
<laughs> when were you wont to be so full of songs, Sarah? I have used it, Uncle, ere since thou made thy daughters thy mothers. For when thou gavest them the rod and puts down thine own breeches, <gasps> then they for sad and joy did weep, and I for sorrow sung that such a king should play boop <gasps> and go the fools among. <laughs> Pretty uncle, keep a schoolmaster that can teach thy fool to lie. I would fain learn to lie. Then you lie, Sarah, we'll have you whipped. I marvel what kin thou and thy daughters are. They'll have me whipped for speaking true. Thou'lt have me whipped for lying. And sometimes I am whipped for holding my peace. <laughs> I had rather be any kind of thing than a fool. And yet I would not be thee, uncle. Thou hast paired thy wit to both sides and left nothing in the middle. <laughs> oh, here comes one of the pairings. Oh, well, how now, daughter? What makes that frontlet on? Methinks you are too much late of the frown. Thou wast a pretty fellow when thou hadst no care <coughs> for her frowning. Now thou art an O without a figure. I am better than thou art now. I am a fool. Thou art nothing. Yes, forsooth, I will hold my tongue. So your face bids me, though you say nothing. Mamma, he that keeps no cross for crumb, weary of all shall want some. That's a shell piece cut. <laughs> Not only, sir, this is your all-licensed fool, but other of your insolent retinue do hourly carp and quarrel, breaking forth in rank and not to be endured riots. Sir, I had thought by making this well known unto you to have found a safe redress, but now grow fearful by what yourself too late have spoke and done that you protect this course and put it on by your allowance, which if you should, the fault would not scape censure nor the redress sleep, which in the tender of a wholesome wheel might in their working do you that offence, which else were shame that then necessity will call discreet proceeding. Well, you know, uncle, the hedge sparrow fed the cuckoo <laughs> so long that it had its head bit off by it young. So out went the candle, and we were left darkling. Are you our daughter? I would you would make use of your good wisdom, whereof I know you are fraught, and put away these dispositions of late transport, <coughs> of late transport you from what you rightly are. May not an ass know when the cart draws the horse. <gasps> Whoop! Jug, I love thee. Does any here know me? This is not Lear. <laughs> it is Lear. Walk thus, speak thus. <laughs> Where are his eyes? Either his notion weakens or his discernings are lethargy. Ha! Ah! Waking! Tis not so. Who is it that can tell me who I am? Lear's shadow. I would learn that, for by the marks of sovereignty, knowledge, and reason, I should be false persuaded I had daughters. Which they will make an obedient father. You, your name, fair gentlewoman. This admiration, sir, is much of the savour of other your new pranks. I do beseech you to understand my purposes aright, as you are old and reverend should be wise. Here do you keep a hundred knights and squires, men so disordered, so debauched and bold that this our court, infected with their manners, shows like a riotous inn. Epicurism and lust makes it more like a tavern or a brothel than a graced palace. 
the shame itself doth speak for instant remedy. Be then desired by her that else will take the thing she begs, a little to disquantity your train, and the remainders that shall still depend to be such men as may besought your age, which know themselves and you. Darkness and devils. Sell my horses, call my train together. Degenerate bastard, I'll not trouble thee, yet I have left a daughter. You strike my people, and your disordered rabble make servants of their betters. Woe that too late repents. Oh, oh sir, are you come? Oh, is it your will? Speak, sir, prepare my horses. Ingratitude, thou. Marble-hearted fiend, more hideous whence thou showest thee in a child than the sea monster! Pray, sir, be patient. <laughs> the tusted kite! Thou liest. I train are men of choice and rarest parts, that all the particulars of duty know, and in the most exact regard support the worships of that name. O oh, most small fault, how ugly didst thou in Cordelia's show, oh, which like an angel wretched my frame of nature from the fixed place drew from my heart all love and added to the goal. Oh, Lear, 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 <sighs> bait at this gate that let thy folly in and thy dear judgment out. Go, 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 my people. My lord, I am guiltless as I am ignorant of what hath moved you. It may be so, my lord. Hear, nature, hear! Dear goddess, hear! Suspend thy purpose if thou didst intend to make this creature fruitful. Into her womb convey sterility. Dry up in the organs of increase. In her and from her derogate body never spring a babe to honor her. If she must team, create her child of spleen, that it may live and be a thwart disnatured torment to her. Let it stamp wrinkles in her brow of youth, with cadent tears, fret channels in her cheeks, turn all her mother's pains and benefits to laughter and contempt that she may feel. How sharper than a serpent's tooth it is to have a thankless child! Away! Away! Now, gods that we adore, whereof comes this? Never afflict yourself to know more of it, but let his disposition have that scope as dotage gives it. What? Fifty of my followers in a clap? Within a fortnight. What's the matter, sir? I'll tell thee. Life and death. I am ashamed that thou hadst the power to shake my manhood thus. That these hot tears which break from me perforce should make thee worth them. Blasts and fogs upon thee. The untempted woundings of a father's curse pierce every sense about thee. Oh, oh, fond eyes, no, but weep this cause again. I'll pluck you out and cast you with the waters that you loose to temper clay. Yea, does it come to this? Ha, let it be so. I, I have another daughter who I am sure is kind and comfortable when, when she shall hear this of thee with her, her nails shall flay thy wolf as visage. Uh, thou shalt find that I'll resume the shape which thou dost think I'll have cast off forever. Do you mark that? I cannot be so partial, Goneril, to the great love I bear you. I... Pray you content. What, Oswald, ho? You, sir, more knave than fool after your master. Uncle Lear, Uncle Lear Tarry, take the fool with you. A fox, when one has caught her, and such a daughter should sure to the slaughter if my cap would buy a halter. So the fool follows after. 
this man hath had good counsel a hundred nights tis politic and safe to let him keep at point a hundred nights yes that on every dream each buzz each fancy each complaint dislike he may engard his dosage dotage with their powers and hold our lives in mercy oswald i say well you may fear too much safer than to trust too much let me still take away the harms i fear not fear still to be taken i know his heart what he hath uttered i have i have writ my sister if she sustain him in his hundred nights when i have shown showed the unfitness what how now oswald what have you have you writ that letter to my sister i madame Take you some company and away to horse. Inform her full of my particular fear, and thereto add such reasons of your own as may compact it more. Get you gone and hasten your return. No, no, my lord. This milky gentleness and course of yours, though I condemn not, yet under pardon, you are much more at task for want of wisdom than praised for harmful mildness. How far your eyes may pierce, I cannot tell. Striving to be better, oft we mar what's well. Nay, then... Well, well, the event. Caius! Ah, go you before Gloucester with these letters. Acquaint my daughter no further with anything you know that comes from her demand out of the letter. If your diligence be not speedy, I shall be there for you. I will not sleep, my lord, till I have delivered. If a man's brains were in his heels, were not in danger of kites. Aye, boy. Then I pray thee be merry. Thy wit shall not go slipshod. <laughs> shall see thy other daughter will use thee kindly, for though she's as like this as a crab's like uh, ooh, an apple, yet I can tell what I can tell. Uh, what canst thou tell, boy? <sighs> she will taste as like this as a crab does to a crab. Thou canst tell why one's nose stands in the middle of one's face. Hmm? No. Why to keep one's eyes of either side's nose, that what a man cannot smell out, he may spy into. I did her wrong. Canst tell how an oyster makes his shell? No. Nor I neither. <gasps> but I can tell why a snail has a house. Why? Why, to put his head in, not to give it away to his daughters and leave his horns without a case. I will forget my nature. Oh, so kind a of father. <laughs> Be my horses ready. Thy asses are gone about them. The reason why the seven stars are no more than seven is a pretty reason. Mm. Because they are not eight. <gasps> yes, indeed. Oh, thou wouldst make a good fool. Oh, to take it again perforce, a monster in gratitude. If thou wert my fool, Nuggle, I'd have thee beaten for being old before thy time. How's that? Well, thou shouldst not have been old till thou hadst been wise. Oh. Oh, oh. Let, let, let me not be mad. Not, not mad, sweet heaven. Keep me in temper. Hmm? I would not be mad. Hmm? How now? Are the horses ready? Ready, my lord. Come, boy. She that's a maid now 
and laughs at my departure shall not be made long unless things be cut. Shorter. Cut. Save thee, Karen. And you, sir, I have been with your father, given him notice that the Duke of Cornwall and Reagan, his duchess, will be here with him this night. How comes that? Nay, I know not. You have heard of the news abroad? I mean, the whispered ones, for they are yet but ear-kissing arguments. Not I pray you, what are they? Have you heard of no likely wars toward twixt the Dukes of Cornwall and Albany? Not a word. You may do then, in time. Fare you well, sir. The Duke, be here tonight, the better best. This weaves itself perforce into my business. My father hath set up a guard to take my brother, and I have one thing of an easy, of a queasy question in which I may act on briefness and fortune work. Brother, a word, descend. Brother, I say. <clears throat> my father watches. Oh, sir, fly this place. Intelligence is given where you are hid. You have now the good advantage of the night. Have you not spoken against the Duke of Cornwall? He's coming hither now in the night, in the haste, and Reagan with him. Have you nothing said upon his party against the Duke of Albany? Advise yourself. I'm sure on it, not a word. I hear my father coming, pardon me. In cunning, I must draw my sword upon you. Draw, seem to defend yourself. Now, quit you well. Yield, come before my father. Light ho there, fly brother, fly. Torches, torches, so farewell. Some blood drawn on me will beget opinion of my more fierce endeavor. I've seen drunkards do more with this in sport. Father, father, stop. Stop, no help! Now, Edmund, where's the villain? He stood, here stood he in the dark, his sharp sword out, mumbling of wicked charms, conjuring the moon to stand auspicious mistress. But where is he? Look, sir, I bleed. Where is the villain, Edmund? Fled this way, sir, when by no means he could. Pursue him, ho, oh, go after. Oh, by no means what? Persuade me to the murder, murder of your lordship, but that I told him the revenge in God's against parricides did all the thunder bend, spoke on how manifold and strong upon the child was bound to the father's sure and fine, seeing how loathly opposite I stood to his unnatural purpose in fell motion was his prepared sword that he charges home my unprovided body lanced mine arm when and when he saw my best alarmed spirits bold in the quarrel right roused to the encounter or whether gasped by the noise i made he suddenly fled Let him uncaught and found despair. Arch and patron comes tonight by his authority. I will pro proclaim it that he bringing the murderous coward to the death. When I dissuaded him from his intent and found him, Pit to do it, with cursed speech I threatened to discover him. He replied, thou unpossessing bastard, dost thou think 
if I would stand against thee with the reposal of any trust, virtue, or worth in thee, make thy words fail, no, what I should deny. As this I would, though thou didst produce my very character, I'd turn it all to thy suggestion, plot, and damned in practice, and thou must make a dullard of the world, if thou not thought the prophets of my death were the very pageant and potential spurs to the to make thee seek it. Strange and fastened villain. Would he deny his letter, said he? I never trumpets. I know not why he comes. All ports I'll bear, bar. The villain shall not escape. The Duke must grant me that. Besides, his picture I will send far and near that all the kingdom may have due note of him and of my land. Loyal and natural boy, I'll... How now, my noble friend? Since I came hither, which I can call, but now I have heard strange news. If it be true, all vengeance comes too short. Which can pursue the offender? How dost, my lord? Oh, madam, my old heart is cracked. It's cracked. What, did my father's godson seek your life? He whom my father named your Edgar? Oh, lady. Lady, shame would have it hid. Is he not companion with the right with the righteous riotous knights that tended upon my father? I know not I know not, madam. Tis too bad. Too bad. Yes, madam. He was out of that consort. No marvel then. Though he were ill-affected, tis they have put them on an old man's death. To have the expense and waste of his revenues, I have this present evening from my sister, been well informed of them, and with such cautions, that if they come to sojourn in my house, I'll not be there. Nor I assure thee, Regan. Edmund, I hear that you have sworn your father a childlike office. It was my duty, sir. He did bewray his practice, and received this hurt you see striving to apprehend him. Is he pursued? Aye, my good lord. If he be taken, he shall never more be feared of doing harm. Make your own purpose, how in my strength you please. For you, Edmund, whose virtue and obedience doth this instant so much command itself, you shall be ours. Natures of such deep trust, we shall much need. You, we first seize on. I shall serve you, sir, truly, however else. For him, I, I thank your grace. You know not why we came to visit you, Thus, out of season, threading dark-eyed night, occasions with noble Gloucester of some poise, wherein we must have use of your advice. Our father, he hath writ, so hath our sister, are of differences which I best thought it fit to answer from our home. The several messengers from hence attacked and dispatch, our good old friend lay comforts to your bosom and bestow your needful counsel to our business, which craves instant use. Mm. I serve you, madam. Your graces are right welcome. Good dawning to thee, friend. Part of this house. Hi. Where, we, me, where may we set our horses? In the mire. Prithee, if thou lovest me, tell me. I love thee not. Why then, I care not for thee. If I had thee in Lichfield Pinfold, I would make thee care for me. Why dost thou use me thus? 
I know thee not. Fellow, I know thee. What dost thou know me for? A knave, a rascal, an eater of broken meats, a base, proud, shallow, beggarly, three-suited, hundred-pound, filthy, worsted, stocking knave, a lily-livered, action-taking, horse and glass glazing super-serviceable, five, finical rogue, one trunk inheriting slave, one that wouldst be a bored in way of good service, and art nothing but the composition of a knave, beggar, coward, pander, and the son and heir of a mongrel bitch, one whom I will beat into clamorous whining if thou deniest the least syllable of thy addition. Why, what a monstrous fellow art thou thus to rail on one that is neither known of thee nor knows thee? What a brazen violet art thou to deny thou knowest me? Is it two days ago since I tripped up thy heels and beat thee before the king? Draw, you rogue, for though it be night, yet the moon shines, I'll make a supper the moonshine of you, you horse and pallion barber maker. Draw! Away! I have nothing to do with thee. Draw, you rascal! You come with letters against the king to take vanity, the part against the royalty of their father. Draw, you rogue, or I'll so carbonado your shanks. Draw, you rascal! Come your ways! Strike, you slave! Stand, rogue! Stand, you meek slave! Strike! Help! Help! Are you goodman boy, if you please? Come, I'll flesh you! Come on, young master! Weapons! Arms! What's the matter here? Keep peace upon your lives! He dies that strikes again. What is the matter? The messengers from our sister and the king. What is your difference? Speak. I'm scarce some breath, my lord. No marvel, you have so bestirred your valor. You cowardly rascal, nature disclaims in thee, and a tailor lady. Thou art a strange fellow. A tailor make a man. A tailor, sir, a stone cutter or a painter could not have made him so ill, though they had been but two years in the trade. Speak yet, how grew your quarrel? This ancient ruffian, sir, whose life I have spared and suit of his grey beard. Oh, son, Zed, thou unnecessary letter, my lord, if you will give me leave, I will tread this unbolton villain into mortar and daub the wall of Jake's with him. Spare my grey beard, you wattel! Beast, sirrah, you beastly knave, know you no reference? Yes, sir, but anger has a privilege. Why art thou angry? But such a slave as this should wear a sword who wears no honesty. Such smiling rogues as these like rats off fight the holy cords of twain which are too intrinsic and loose. Smooth every passion that the natures of their lords rebel, being oil to fire, snow to the colder moods. Plague, affirm, and turn their halcyon beaks with every gale and vary of their masters, knowing naught like dogs but following a plague upon your epileptic village. Smile you at my speeches as I would have thought. Deuce, if I had you upon serum plain, I'd drive you tackling home to Camelot. What? Art thou mad, old fellow? <laughs> How fell you out? Say that. No countries hold more antipathy than I am such a knave. Why dost thou call him knave? What is his fault? His countenance likes me not. No more perchance does mine, nor his, nor hers. It is my occupation to be plain. I've seen better faces in my time than stands on any shoulder that I see before me at this instant. This is some fellow who, having been praised for bluntness, doth affect a saucy roughness and constrains the garb quite from his nature. He cannot flatter, he. An honest mind and plain, he must speak truth, and they will take it. So if not, he's plain. 
These kind of knaves I know, which in this plainness harbor more craft and more corrupter ends than twenty silly ducking observants that stretch their duties nicely. Sir, in good faith, in sincere verity, under the allowance of your great aspect, whose influence, like the wreath of radiant fire on flickering Phoebus' front. What meant by this? To go out of my dialect, which you discommend so much. I know, sir, I am no flatterer. He that beguiled you in a plain accent was a plain name, which for my part I will not be, though I should win your displeasure to entreat me to it. What was the offence you gave him? Hmm? I never gave him any. Please, the king is master, very late to strike at me upon his misconstruction. When he, compact and flattering his displeasure, tripped me behind, being down, insulted, railed, and put upon him such a deal of man that worthied him, got praises of the king for him attempting who was self-subdued. And in the fleshment of this dread exploit, drew on me here again. None of these rogues and cowards, but Ajax is their fault. Fetch forth the stocks, you stubborn ancient knave. You reverent braggarts, we'll teach you. Sir, I am too old to learn. All not your stocks for me, I serve the king. On whose employment I was sent to you, you shall not do small respect. So too bold malice against the grace and person of my master, stocking his messenger. Fetch forth the stocks. As I have life and honor, there shall he sit till noon. Till noon? Till night, my lord, and all night, too. Ay, madam, if I were your father's dog, you should not use me so. Sir, being his knave, I will. This is a fellow of the self-same color our sister speaks of. Um, bring away the stocks. Let me beseech your grace not to do so. His fault is much, and the good king, his master, will check him for it. Your purposed low correction is such as basest and contemnest wretches for pilferings and most common trespasses are punished with. The king must take it ill that he, so slightly valued in his messenger, should have him thus restrained. I'll answer that. My sister may receive it much more worse to have her gentleman abused, assaulted for following her affairs, put in his legs. Come, my good lord, away. I am sorry for thee, friend. Tis the Duke's pleasure, whose disposition all the world well knows, will not be rubbed nor stopped. I'll entreat for thee. Pray do not, sir. I have watched and traveled hard. Sometime I shall sleep out, rest or whistle. A good man's fortune may grow out at heels. I'll give you good morrow. The Duke's to blame in this. Twill be ill taken. Good King, it must approve the common saw. Thou out of heaven's benediction comes to warm the sun. Approach thy beacon to this underglobe that by thy comfortable beams I may peruse this letter. Nothing almost sees miracles but misery. I know it is from Cordelia, who hath most fortunately been informed of my obscured course, and shall find time from this enormous state giving to give losses their remedies. All weary and all watched. <sighs> Take vantage, heavy eyes. Not to behold this shameful lodging. Fortune, good night. Smile once more. 
turn thy wheel. I heard myself proclaimed and by the happy hollow of a tree escaped the hunt. No port is free, no place that guard and most unusual vigilance does not attend my taking. Was I may escape, I will preserve myself and am the thought to take the basest and most poorest shape that ever pernerier in contempt of man brought near to beast. My face, I'll grind with filth, blanket my loins, elf all my ears and knots, and with presented nakedness out face the winds and persecutions of the sky. The country gives me proof and precedent of bedlam beggars who with roaring voices strike in their numbed and mortified arms, pins, wooden pricks, nails, sprigs of rosemary, and with this horrible object from low farms, poor pelting villages, sheep coats and, and, and mills, sometime with lunatic bands, sometimes with prayers, enforce their charity. Poor Turley God, poor Tom. And that's something yet. Edgar, I nothing am. Tis strange that they should so depart from home and not send back my messenger. As I learned, the night before there was no purpose in them of the moot remove. Uh. Oh. Hail to thee, noble master. <laughs> Makest thou this shame thy pastime? No, oh, my lord. Oh, it wears cruel garters. Horses are tied by the heads. Dogs and bears by the neck. Monkeys by the loins. And men by the legs. When a man's of a lusty legs, then he wears wooden leather stocks. What's he hath so much thy place mistook to set thee here? Is it is both he and she, your son and daughter? No. Yes. No, I say. I say yea. By Jupiter, I swear no. I do know. I swear I. Oh, they durst not do it. No, they, they, they could not, would not do it. Tis worse than murder to do upon respect such violent outrage. Resolve me with all modest haste which way thou mightst deserve, or they impose this usage coming from us. My lord, when at their home I did commend your highness's letter to them, ere I was risen from the place that showed my duty kneeling, in there a reeking ghost stewed in his haste, half breathless, panting forth from Goneril's mistress salutations, delivered letters, spite of intermission, which presently they read, on whose contents they summoned up their meanie, straight took horse, commanded me to follow and attend the leisure of their answer, gave me cold looks. And meeting here the other messenger, whose welcome I perceived had poisoned mine, being the very fellow which of late displayed so saucily against your highness, having more man than wit about me, drew. He raised the house with loud and coward cries. Your son and daughter found this trespass worth the shame which here it suffers. Winter's not gone yet. If the wild geese fly that way, fathers that wear red do make their children blind. But fathers that bear bags shall see their children cry. Fortune that Aaron poor ne'er turns the key to the poor. But for all this, <laughs> thou shalt have as many dough lords for thy daughters as thou canst tell in a year. Oh, oh this mother swells up toward my heart. Oh, hysterical, Paso! Down! 
thou climbing sorrow, thy elements below. Where is this daughter? The Earl, sir, here within. Follow me not, stay here. May I do no more offence, but what you speak of? None. I chance the king comes with so small a number. <laughs> and thou hadst been set of the stocks for that question. Thou'dst well deserved it. Why, fool? We'll set thee to school to an act to teach thee there's no labouring in winter. All that follow their noses are led by their eyes, but blind men, and there's not a nose among twenty, <laughs> but can smell it and stinking. Oh. Let go that hold when a great wheel runs down a hill, lest it break thy neck with following. But the great one that goes upward, let him draw thee after. When a wise man gives thee better counsel, give me mine again. I would have none but knaves follow it, since a fool gives it. That, sir, which serves and seeks for gain and follows but for form, will pack when it begins to rain and leave thee in the storm. But I will tarry. The fool will stay and let the wise man fly. The knave turns fool that runs away. <laughs> the fool, no knave, her die. I learn thou this, fool. Not in the stocks, fool. <sighs> Deny to speak with me. They are sick. They are weary. They have traveled all the night. Mere fetches the images of revolt and flying off. Fetch me a better answer. My dear Lord, you know the fiery quality of the Duke, how unremovable and fixed he is in his own course. Vengeance, plague, death, confusion. Fiery, what quality? Why Gloucester, Gloucester? I'll speak with the Duke of Cornwall and his wife. Well, my... My good lord, I have informed them so. Informed them? Dost thou understand me, woman? Hi, my good lord. The king would speak with Cornwall. The dear father would with his daughter speak commands, tend service. Are they informed of this? My breath and blood! Fiery! The fiery duke! Well, tell the hot duke that... No, not yet. No, 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 maybe, maybe he is not well. No, infirmity doth still neglect all office where to our health is bound. We are not ourselves when nature being oppressed commands the mind to suffer with the body. I'll forbear and am fallen out with my more headier will to take the indisposed and sickly fit for the sound man. Oh, death on my state. Wherefore should he sit here? This act persuades me that this remotion of the duke and her is practice only. Give me my servant forth. Go tell the duke's and his wife I'll speak with them. Now, now, presently, bid them come forth and hear me, or at their chamber door I'll beat the drum Till it cry sleep to death. I would have all well betwixt you. Oh, me, my heart, my rising heart, but down. Cry to it, Nuncle, as the cock needed to the eels when she put him in the paste alive. She napped him with a cock combed with a stick and cried, Down, wantons, down! It was her brother that in pure kindness to his horse, buttered his hay. Oh, good morrow to you both. Hail to your grace. 
I'm glad to see you, Your Highness. Regan, I think you are. I know what reason I have to think so. If thou shouldst not be glad, I would divorce me from my mother's tomb, sepulchring with an adulteress. Oh, oh, are, are you free? Uh, some other time for that. Beloved Regan, thy sister's not. Oh, Regan, she hath tied sharp-toothed unkindness like a vulture. Here! I can scarce speak to thee. Thou'lt not believe with how depraved equality, O oh, Regan. Pray you, sir, take patience. Have hope. You less know how to value her desert than she, than she to her scant duty. Say, how is that? I cannot think my sister in the least would fail her obligation. It, sir, perchance she have restrained the riots of your followers is on such ground and to such wholesome end as clears her from all blame. Oh, my curse is on her. Oh, sir, you are old. Nature in you stands on the very verge of his confine. You should be ruled and led by some discretion that discerns your state better than you yourself. Therefore, I pray you that to our sister you do make a return. Say you have wronged her. <gasps> Ask her forgiveness. Do you but mark how, how this becomes the house of... Oh, dear daughter, I confess that I am old. Age is unnecessary. I own my knees. I beg that you'll vouchsafe me raiment, bed, and food. Good sir, no more. These are unsightly tricks. Return you to my sister. Never, Regan. She hath abated me of my train, looked black upon me, struck me with her tongue, most serpent-like upon the very heart. All the storied vengeances of heaven fall on her ungrateful top. Strike her young bones, you taking airs with lameness. Fie, sir, fie. You nimble lightnings dart your blinding flames into her scornful eyes. Infect her beauty, you fen-sucked fogs drawn by the powerful sun to fail and blister. No, blessed gods, so you will wish on me when the rash mood is on. No, Regan, thou shalt never have my curse. Thy tender, hefted nature shall not give thee o'er to harshness. Her eyes are fierce, but thine do comfort and not burn. Tis not in thee to grudge my pleasures, to cut off my train, to bandy hasty words, to scant my sizes, and in conclusion, to oppose the bolt against my coming in. Thou better knowest the offices of nature, bond of childhood, effects of courtesy, dues of gratitude, thy half of the kingdom thou hast not forgot wherein I thee endowed. Good sir, to thy purpose. Who put my fool in the stocks? What trumpet's that? Oh, uh, I know it. It's my sister's. This approves her letter that she would soon be here. Is your lady come? This is a slave whose easy borrowed pride dwells in the fickle grace of her he follows. Out, violet from my sight! What means your grace? Who stalked my servant? Regan, I have good hope thou didst not know on it. Who comes here? Oh, 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 heavens. If you do love old men, if your sweet sway allow obedience, if you yourselves are old, make it your cause. Send down and take my part. Art not ashamed to look upon this beard. Oh, Regan, oh, Regan, will you take her by the hand? Why not by the hand, sir? How have I offended? All's not offence that indiscretion finds and dotage terms so. Oh, sides, you are too tough. Will you yet hold? How came my man in the stocks? I set him there, sir. But his own disorder has deserved much less advancement. You? Did you? 
I pray you, Father, being weak seems so if till the expiration of your month, you will return and sort them with my sister, dismissing <sighs> half your train. Come then to me. I am now from home and out of that provision which shall be needful for your entertainment. Return to her and fifty men dismiss it? No, rather I abjure all roofs and choose to wage against the enmity of the air. To be a comrade with a wolf and owl, necessity's sharp pitch, return with her. Oh, why, the hot-blooded France that dourless took our youngest born, I could as well be brought to knee his throne and squire-like pension beg to keep base life afoot, return with her. Who will persuade me rather than be slave and sumpter to this detested groom? At your choice, sir. 